Hey, what up everybody? Hope you're having a great day. My name is Jay and you're watching Clouded Reactions. So today we're going to be reacting to the second part of the Swedish trilogy, um, The Empire Strikes Back. I'm not 100% not sure why they're doing the reference between the Star Wars and um, the Swedish Empire. Um, maybe they just because they like Star Wars is what it seems like, I don't know. So the last episode we were learning more about Christina and how she was more of, not really Swedish as history, but more of... Um, the king or queen at that time, their history. Because we learned about Christina, really, and what she was like as a person, you know, her likes and dislikes, where she went off to and such. And, yeah, it wasn't really a whole lot about Swedish history. So maybe part two, they're going to get more into it, or we're just talking about kings and queens here. But shut up, Jay, let's just hop right on in. Hello, everyone. I'm Joachim from Salaton. And I'm Indy Nidell, and this is part two of our Swedish trilogy, The Empire Strikes Back. I'm so glad Yoke knows how to play the piano. I think this episode is actually more the two powers than the Empire Strikes Back. And yes, this is part two of the Swedish trilogy that covers the events of Sweden's great power period that are not covered in the episodes about each of the songs on the album Carolus Rex. After several years of absence in wars against Poland and Denmark, King Charles X, well, Carl Dentillon de Gustav's return to Stockholm was a brief one. In 1660, he fell ill with pneumonia and died during just the fifth year of his reign. His son Charles was just five years old at the time, so regency went to the Dowager Queen Hedvig Eleonora and a regency council. The council and the queen did not get along well, however. While the queen was pretty indifferent to politics, she was unwilling to compromise her position in the realm. The council, on the other hand, lacked the quality statesman of the past, pretty much. Stuck in a power struggle of private feuds and personal rivalries, the country fell into fiscal mismanagement and military and defensive neglect. Even King Charles, once he was crowned Karl den Elfte, Karl XI, did not embody the traits of a modern monarch. He had no interest in statecraft. He could barely read or speak any foreign language other than a bit of German, and overall had little knowledge of the world outside the Swedish borders. It did not take long for Sweden's numerous enemies to notice Sweden's weakness. Prussia's victory at the Battle of Fairbellin in 1675 had little strategic impact, but it clearly showed that the fearsome Swedish lion might have grown tame. There had been talks of a proposed wedding between young Karl and the Danish princess to ensure peace between the two countries, but the loss at Fairbellin destroyed such hopes. Instead, Danish King Christian V declared war on the Swedes. In June the next year, the Danish fleet set sail. A military alliance with the Dutch had ensured that Denmark not only had a modern army, but also a top-of-the-line navy. Without much trouble, the Danish fleet swept the inferior Swedish navy aside. Unchallenged, the Danes raided and bombarded the Swedish islands, blockaded Gothenburg, and prevented Sweden from shifting reinforcements across the Baltic Sea. Then invasion force of 14,000 Danes landed unopposed on the beaches south of Helsingborg. King Christian's goal was to reconquer Scania, the economic breadbasket of southern Sweden. The news of the Danish invasion spread fear across the Swedish realm. Karl began to realize how badly the interim regency had mismanaged the defensive capabilities of the state. The Swedes were unable to resist the invasion because there was simply no army in southern Sweden strong enough to do so. Just like the navy, the fortresses and garrisons had been neglected, and one strong point after the other fell, or more often willingly surrendered to the Danes. Morale plummeted as the king and his small army retreated from one position to the other, just ahead of the Danish advance. Karl felt that he had already lost the war without fighting a single battle. He was still young and inexperienced, and the magnitude of the mismanagement had shattered his confidence. Nothing was prepared, no supplies, nothing. All summer long, the Danish offensive continued. King Christian captured Helsingborg and Landskrona, taking over mighty fortresses with minimal effort. Soon, all of southwestern Scania 
was occupied by the Danes. King Kral went to Krihwanstad, one of his last bastions in Scania, the key to its eastern part. By the beginning of August, the Danes arrived as well. Once more, King Karl withdrew. Krihwanstad, however, resisted fiercely before it was eventually conquered with heavy Danish losses. This gave Karl a bit of confidence, but still, with the loss of Krihwanstad, the situation looked grimmer than ever. It was soon late September, and Danish King Christian prepared his troops to go into winter quarters while the Danish Navy returned to Copenhagen. The war, he boasted, would be won in the coming spring. But the Danes had been fighting the war in Scania in continental fashion, meaning they aimed at beating their opponents by sieges and maneuvers. So the Swedes thought they had to change strategy. King Karl looked back to the legendary victories of Gustav Adolf in the Thirty Years' War, who had destroyed his enemies by decisive and brilliant strategic battles. Karl had barely any other option left. He either could retreat north with his starving army, which would mean he'd lose all of Scania to the Danes, or he could attack the Danish army while being heavily outgunned and outnumbered. Chances were slim there, but slim chances are usually better than no chances at all. So while the Danes prepared for winter quarters, King Karl went on the offensive. November, some long-awaited reinforcements had arrived from the north, around 12,000 fighting men and 30 cannons. They avoided the major Danish detachments as they headed towards Malmö, the last Swedish stronghold in the south that still held out. It was December as they reached nearby Lund, near the river Schäblinge. The harsh Swedish winter was now in full swing, allowing a safe crossing of the frozen river. On the 4th of December, the two armies met on the field of battle. The outnumbered Swedish troops had bound wreaths of straw around their left arms and their felt hats to distinguish themselves from the Danes. Karl knew that his only chance relied on bringing the fight to the enemy, and he had planned new, extremely aggressive tactics. At 8.30 a.m., as the winter sun began to rise, the battle began. Right from the start, the battle was incredibly vicious. Sweden was fighting for its life. At a distance of 200 meters, the Swedish right wing charged. The Swedish Life Regiment of Horse advanced forward on the flank, holding against multi Danish counterattacks until the Swedish second line joined the fray. At a distance of 80 paces, its first rank discharged their guns. Then the second line marched forward, discharging another volley into the Danish troops, followed by the third rank while the first was reloading their muskets. This way, the Swedish infantry steadily advanced under a curtain of fire. At around 10 to 12 paces away, when they could see the white of their enemy's eyes, all three ranks fired one final devastating volley, then they charged with rapier in hand and musket reversed. The cavalry did as well, only once discharging their pistols before plowing into the enemy. Charles' new shock tactics were risky, as they relied on speed and discipline, but they worked because the Swedes stood with their backs to the wall. King Karl rode with the right flank, urging his men forward by fearless example. Many generals and high officers around him fell to mortal wounds. Once, Karl found himself surrounded by a Danish squadron, just like Gustav Adolf at Lützen. But Charles only wore a simple uniform, and the smoke from the guns was so thick that Danes did not recognize him, and he got away. Soon after 10 a.m., the Danish left finally broke. King Christian, who had gone to observe the fight on his left, was caught up by the headlong flight as Karl charged forward. This was a battle where the death of either king would have had a decisive impact on the whole war. But while Christian did perhaps have the luxury of fleeing the field, Karl gave pursuit with the fury born of desperation. The Swedes were victorious on their right, but their own left flank was in trouble. For hours the air was filled with lead and smoke, Many units lost cohesion when their officers were killed. The Swedes were wavering, barely hanging on. Only the limited visibility really saved them. Then at three in the afternoon, something unexpected happened. When a group of Swedish cavalrymen were spotted in the Danish rear, the Danish commander 
ordered his whole army to turn. See, he believed this was the vanguard of a second Swedish army approaching from the north, when in <laughs> fact, this was just King Carl's small band of cavalry returning to the battle after giving chase. Carl spurred his men forward again. During the big turnaround, the Danish cavalry and infantry were pushed tightly together, blocking each other, and Carl crashed right into them. It was, it was pure mayhem, and most of the Swedish cavalrymen fell or fled, but Carl, three of his bodyguards, managed to punch through the Danish lines. He galloped on, rejoining his army. Reinvigorated by the king's return, the Swedish army found new courage. Both sides were exhausted, but the morale boost and the ensuing confusion on the Danish right decided the battle. The Swedes advanced in a pincer, and the Danish lines began to collapse. 5 p.m., as darkness fell over the field, the Battle of Lund was over. The Swedes were victorious, but in no condition to give further pursuit. It had been an extremely bloody battle. Half of the men that entered the field now lay dead or wounded on the field. The Danes had suffered 6,000 killed and 3,000 captured, the Swedes up to 3,000 dead. Much of the Danish leadership was lost, and many units were simply wiped out. But the aggressive tactics had cost the Swedes dearly as well. The victory at the Battle of Lund, though, gave Karl the opportunity to take back the initiative in the coming spring. The war was not over, and Scania had not fallen into Danish hands. King Christian would return, but the Swedes were back in the fight. The young King Karl grown up to fill the shoes of a warrior king. As long as he lived, he would celebrate the anniversary of the Battle of Lund, not with parades, but with prayer. But once more, the future of the Swedish Empire lay on the fields of battle. a Swedish empire. It wasn't just its local region, so technically it was an empire. But what does that mean? Was it a great empire? I, I wouldn't say so, really. I mean, <laughs> it did, did it have a great population? No. no. It, it did take over a bunch of land. Yeah. And, oh, they killed a lot of people. Yeah. Great murderers. They came <laughs> up with, but they came up with ways to kill people more efficiently and faster than other countries. And that's why they could do that with a small oh, population. Yes. And, I mean, I think it's in the Swedish history books, it is talked about as Stormark's team and all the great, yeah, great, great empires, but really, I mean, you're not talking, you know, Mongolian empires. That I'd was say. like, that was the biggest empire in history. Yeah, that's what, you know, or I mean, you talk Roman Empire, you talk yeah. all of these empires, of all of them, the most insignificant, the smallest of them all was the, the Swedish. Well, you know, not, not to the Swedes. No, no, no. I mean, I'm not pissing on, on the Swedish history or that. But it, it, I think <laughs> it would be doing this if you were. <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about, you know, comparatively, the Swedish Empire is, uh, I think it's really interesting history, yeah. part of history, but it wasn't really that big. We're talking size, no. and, you know, and in, important for, you know, upcoming historical events, not that much, really. It's interesting what then, because there are small empires yep you know um you have empires far smaller than the swedish empire we should do like a whole series about small empires right you do like uh, abyssinia as one that was you know in highly selassie and ethiopia this is just, he was emperor he wasn't king so what, what does it what's i mean technically all you need to do is say i'm emperor so that well no well kingdom by the way let's start the settlement empire i'm the emperor oh well, you have to okay you have to start with your Sabaton fiefdom, right? Okay. You have this, this land. This is your ancestral lands and stuff where your people have lived on for, since before memory, which is like 80 years, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Because you guys don't write because it's a long time ago. So you have your Sabaton fiefdom, then you unite the local fiefdoms, so much as Genghis Khan did of uh, uniting the Mongolian tribes by playing them off against each other. And then he took over. He was really only king then. He, 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 what we would consider a king once he had united the Mongolian tribes. Yep. But it's still the Mongolian region. It was when he expanded into China and took over that whole area of northern China, and and this is and this is this is this is scary. This is this is this is like Hitler level scary stuff. <laughs> you don't think about because Genghis Khan's so long ago that you don't think about it. But he he killed 10, 15 million people maybe in that area because he needed the land for his sheep. 
They needed the land for the Mongolian <laughs> sheep to graze. They depopulated that whole part of northern China. It might not have been 10, 15 million people. I wasn't there. But it was a <laughs> lot of people, and it was depopulated because he needed the land for his sheep. But once you've started taking over other what are effectively other sovereign nations or empires, yep. you now you now you're not just a kingdom. Now you are several kingdoms. Now you're an empire. Like the the Austro-Hungarian emperor was the king of Hungary. Yep. But there was more. So he was. So that's. So when it was when when you were no longer just king of Sweden and you had expanded into the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth or into Holy Roman Empire, then you were an empire. Even though some of those places in in the Holy Roman Empire, they were like. Okay, like from that wall to that wall, and then from the camera to back here, that's like a province in, in what's in, now, in, in like the 60, early 1600s in Germany. And you'd be the Duke. That would be the Sabbath. I like Empire. the sound of that. I like it too. Actually, um, um, wait, hang on. I want the editor to make the flag for the Duchy of Sabaton. And remember, this is 1642, so this is in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, yep. right? Duchy of Sabaton. It's somewhere in what would now be Saxony, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, you guys would have come down there. Yeah. Okay, here's the flag. Ah, oh, it's nice, huh? Yeah, I, like I didn't it. expect <laughs> that. Sabaton. Yeah. Now, you notice I said at the beginning that this was Empire Strikes Back. Yes. Um, and it's because it's part two, even though Empire Strikes Back is part five, but really it's part two. Yeah. And you don't have a problem with that. Nope, not at all. Because I, I don't think I can call part three Return of the Jedi. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be correct. But I'll bet you have a great idea for it. So when, we, when we start part three, don't tell me. Don't tell you. I like to be pleasantly surprised. Oh, we're going to make a cliffhanger. For our, yeah, we're going to make a cliffhanger. Ooh. Okay, so everybody, Ooh. tune in to part three of the Swedish history trilogy, the Swedish trilogy, when Joachim solves the cliffhanger of what are we going to follow up A New Hope and um, Empire Strikes Back with. All right? Yeah. I'm excited. So am I. Okay. Cool. All right, see you next time. Take care. All right, so that's part two down the hatch. It was, um, you know, it's interesting. I thought there was going to be more of a uh, broader sense of what was going on in Sweden or what was going on with their politics and such. It is more like, kind of like a song, how when they do the history of a song, they're just talking about kind of one event or one person. Part one was about Christine, Christina. Part two was about King Charles X. So I wonder, I don't know, part three, it says on the little thing, Return of the King. So maybe the third one's going to be all about Carolus or maybe about some kings after him. I don't know, it'll be interesting to find out. But hope to see that. We won't know until we actually watch the video. So until then, hope you guys stay safe. Enjoy the weather outside. Really be safe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.